What's cracking, big dogs? It's Monday, which means, well, it, it didn't mean so for the last couple weeks, but we're back and we're better than ever. Because I got my man Brett Coleman over here, and we are diving into the business of, we'll, we'll stick with the business of football, because he's not as much, uh, he's not as integrated into the fantasy football space as most of the guests I've had on in the previous weeks and months and, and years of this of this series so far is a series where we dive into the social aspect of of the industry where we talk about engagement on social media when we talk about content creation when we talk about different ways of of monetizing so it's it's a cool little peel back behind the curtains for for the audience members who have been following us as creators for a while you want to maybe get a jump start on creating content yourself you want to just know what's going on within the industry and, and hopefully it could help out some of the the people out there that are, are just getting started in their in their journey of content creation. So I try to bring on, you know, a wide group of people. And I, I think in the fantasy space, a lot of people look at what I'm doing and they think uh, I, I've got a little bit of a foothold on YouTube. And then I look at a guy like Brett, who has got this thing down. He is like five times the size of what I've got going on on YouTube. He's a mastermind when he turns the the camera on. I am a, a big admirer of his work. For those of y'all that have never watched his stuff, I will link all of his stuff in the description down below. He's the creator of The Film Room on YouTube. He's also a co-host of Bootleg Football. The man just knows the ins and outs of football. Like I could never, I will never, and I'm ecstatic to have him on for the series today. Brett, the man with back-to-back -back letters, three separate times in his name, two T's, two L's, two N's, was good. I'm great, man. How are you? I'm chilling. Uh, like I said, I just got my first round of the vaccine shot. So I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping I'm not going to need to call in a reliever by the end of this video. <laughs> yeah, I'm hopefully going to get mine in two weeks. California's a little bit behind New York, but it's coming soon. So I'm excited. Hell yeah. All right. Well, I'm excited to chop it up today. Basically, you know, we talked a little bit behind the scenes, but we are both very into the YouTube space. I personally think it's probably the best place to be in as a content creator right now. The engagement you get with your audience is, is second to none. You know, you can you can think about podcasting as as radio. You could think about YouTube as the modern day TV. I think both of them have a time and place. I think both of them have a very, very, very strong connection. I'll just say I'm glad that we're at where we're at right now in terms of content creation. But to get there, there was a long road, I know. For you, you are someone that's been involved when it comes to football and, and the content of creating stuff around football. So I want to take it back a little bit to where it all began for you uh, in terms of maybe, you know, your love for football, where it started to mix from a passion into more of like a career focused thing for you. So you can kind of start wherever you'd like to. Yeah, I mean, I've I've always loved football. I grew up playing like basically every single sport and everything like that. But football was always, you know, one that like I I can play baseball. Like I played baseball for 13 years, but I don't really like watching baseball on TV. Like as an entertainment product, like football has always been the best sport to me and I think it always will be the best sport to me because it's got physicality, it's got complexity, it's got, you know, storylines. Like as an entertainment product, football is the number one show in this country for a reason. And I've always loved it beyond just, you know, loving the sport, loving the game, everything like that. I love the product of football. And I never really anticipated turning it into a career because, you know, growing up, I always figured like you can only really make a career in football if you're a gifted athlete, which I decidedly not. But when I worked for NFL Network for five years, both during and after when I got out of film school, it kind of started to change for me where I realized like there's an opportunity for me to kind of carve out, you know, my own kind of place in this space. And so like when I started the film room, it actually wasn't even really intended for me to be on camera or doing you know, any of the the narration or anything like that. Like I was making these videos as proof of concept for my producers at NFL Network to have like LaDainian Tomlinson be the presenter or Willie McGinnis or, you know, Deion Sanders, any of those guys that I work with every single day. You know, I was like, well, let me put together this style of content, but then have them present it. And, you know, I was told at the time, like, hey, it's not th this format's probably not best for TV. Like, we really got to keep stuff to like seven, eight minutes, like in a traditional TV space. Like, it's hard to make this style of content work, which they were correct about, like, to be fair, like they were totally right. Like my style of content would not work on TV at all especially now with how much alcohol I drink on camera, like it wouldn't work at all. <laughs> yeah. But I, I kept making them, I kept kind of like refining the formula and everything like that. And then eventually got to the point where like, without even really trying to have it be my own thing, 
I ended up with like 11,000 subscribers, tens of thousands of views. And, you know, my then girlfriend, then eventually wife, you know, she pulled me aside. She's like, look, you're not even trying and you're having success here that 99% of people on YouTube don't have. What happens if you actually try? And so I put in my, I guess you could call it three months notice at NFL Network where I basically told them like, hey, like after this season, I'm done. I'm going to go do this. And, you know, they were all super supportive. Like, I loved working at NFL Network. Like, I'm still in contact with people there. Like, they're invested in me. I'm invested in them. Like, it, I loved working there, but I wanted to pursue content that honestly just wouldn't work on TV. So the Patriots Falcons Super Bowl was my last day at NFL Network. You needed and then to throw the very that next day. You needed to throw that in there. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Of course. Unnecessary. <laughs> Worst day of your life was the best day of my life. I'm just going to put that way. <laughs> no, but then, you know, the day after that, I was, <laughs> I was on my own after that. And, you know, I did the 2017 draft. I did like two videos a week because I had been working on them, you know, for three months and just kind of created a backlog of content and then released it all. And then I basically done one video a week for four years since then, at least for most weeks, and just kind of continuously built and built and built and grew and grew and grew and, grew and Growth has been slow, but steady, and it's always been in one direction. And so I'm thankful for that. Is that I've never really plateaued. It's just continuously gone up. I've continuously tried to reinvent my content. I, I think it's gone well, and I, I honestly never thought it would end up this way, but I'm thankful every single day that it did. Yeah, I mean, let's take let's take it back because we got a lot to unwrap there. So you you went to film school. Mm -hmm. Where where was that? Yeah, Cal State. Uh, I went to Cal State Fullerton. Okay. So you went to film school. Were you doing like creative things in high school? Oh yeah. Yeah. After, um, after a back injury, my freshman year of high school, which I mean, if you ever see me like shivering during this interview, like getting like little spine shivers, that's my leftover nerve damage from that. And so my sophomore year of high school, I joined because I knew like, Hey, there's no way I'm ever going to play sports like long-term with that. So I joined the, I guess you could call it like the television production program at, at Modern Day High School, which is like one of the biggest sports powerhouses, if not the biggest sports powerhouse in the entire nation. Like in terms of the amount of like future pro athletes that school pumps out, it's pretty ridiculous. And so they had like a television program as well, because, you know, we as like the students would work on, you know, basketball broadcast, football broadcast with like a local Fox affiliate and broadcast online and stuff like that. So I I learned TV production and editing and all that kind of stuff in high school. And I fell in love with it, especially on the sports side. And then just kind of kept that going in film school. And, you know, four years later, I ended up doing it professionally on YouTube. Okay. So you have a little bit of this background that's kind of perfect for YouTube. I think a lot of people out there don't have that background. I would say the far, far majority of people don't have the, the, the editing skills or the production skills. I would say almost like no one that starts YouTube, especially not in like the football and fantasy football space, have that background. So it kind of speaks for itself when you turn on the cameras. Like the first thing you notice about Brett Coleman's videos are like, oh, this, you know, as the kids would say, this shit is a vibe. You know what I mean? It's like, it's the nice, like dark <laughs> background. It's like nice and relaxed. You're there drinking everything looks crispy. So the years of learning about it obviously pays off onto YouTube. Now, when you go from film school to the, NFL network. You said you're there for like four or five years. What, ex what exactly are you doing there? You said, all right, you're creating these videos and stuff that you want to be giving to the people that you work with the players and stuff so they could use it as pieces of analysis. So you end up making these videos, you upload them onto YouTube. Are they cool with that? Like, first of all, they're like, yeah, we, we're not really going to use this. So you could like kind of start like building your own brand or uploading it, or they're just like too much stuff going on. They don't really give a shit what you're doing in the back burner. Probably more of like column B than column A where it's, I was using like all 22 footage in like the first year that all 22 was even on game pass. Like it was a brand new thing. It was just kind of on the back burner. And, you know, I would like promote game pass and stuff on the channel, like basically saying like, here's where I get the footage. Cause again, this was a brand new thing. People didn't even know about game pass at that point. So like I was still technically making them money and also like you know the nfl would get copyright claims on the footage so it was still a revenue generator for the league so i don't really think they cared that i was doing it because i was a revenue stream for them and it's kind of continued to be that way for the last five years like i make the league money just by virtue of making videos they get copyright claimed so i that's probably why i'm not getting shut down is because i make them money i don't, I don't <laughs> really know they but see, they, they um, go through their copyright list and they just see brett they're like nick now nah, get him out of here but brett you're good to go you got the hook. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm gonna need to talk to do, you do you get part. do you get strikes 
I don't get strikes, but pretty much 90% of the videos I put up are demonetized. I mean, the way I look at it is like, I'd rather put up a, a video that I think is like higher quality. I mean, listen, like when you're a creator on YouTube and when you're starting to look at this stuff from more of like a, like a business standpoint, you're monetizing in other ways. Like AdSense might work. AdSense might be really good for someone like you who gets like monster numbers of views for each video. But if you're kind of like nickel and diming your way up there and you know, you're a couple thousand views per video, the AdSense you're, you're going to end up getting are like, in my opinion, not worth diminishing the quality of the video. So if there's like a song I want to throw in there or something, like I will gladly not take the $14 that YouTube wants to give me in order to throw that thing in there. So yeah, I, get, I don't get strikes. I think I have one strike on my account right now, but I don't even really know what it was. I think we were like drinking on the live stream one time and they YouTube had a problem with it for some reason. I'm over here like Speak, about to rat you out. Speaking Brett. of yeah <laughs> songs by the way so i i just put up a tevin jenkins episode what was it last week or something like it was eight or nine days ago and you know like that dopamine hit that we all get when like we get a one out of ten on a video where it's like it's a banger yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's doing well so it's at like six hundred thousand views right now in a little over a week that was the scariest I man make... on the scariest man in college right yeah i didn't make a single dime on that because i used 30 seconds of a jaws theme song and like mm. I put it in there because I was like, oh, this is going to be a great intro. Like it's an offensive lineman video. It's probably not even going to do that well anyway. Like it's worth it again for the quality. I was like, I don't give a fuck if I don't make any any money on this because it's like ah, it'll, it'll be fine. If I had known then that it would be my most viewed video ever. I might have made a different decision. I don't regret it, but I might have thought about it. Yeah. Not so using that song. <laughs> I, I get that question a lot from people, uh, especially people starting off in YouTube asking what the copyright deal was. And I think YouTube semi recently, I want to say a year or two ago, got way less strict when it comes to like giving out copyright strikes for a while. They had three copyright strikes. If you use like songs that were not allowed to be used or you use whatever footage that was not supposed to be used, you get strikes on your account. Once you hit the third account, you pretty much be ripped off YouTube or they suspend your account for X number of weeks or whatever. Recently though, they don't give you strikes for that kind of stuff. Like I could pretty much put any song I want to the video. It will just demonetize it or it will give the monetization to, like you said, NFL Network or the artist or whatever. So for anyone out there wondering how that works, that's how that works. You, you for the most part, will not get any sort of strikes. You won't get any copyright infringement. You won't get any in any sort of trouble. The monetization just goes elsewhere. I, I want to I wanna depict that video for a little bit because I think there's some lessons to be learned from that. Now, Monetarily, I want to say something that hits 500,000 views, 600,000 views. Would do you know off the top of your head about how much money that would bring in AdSense wise? So if I bring up my analytics right now, my playback CPM is 10.98. So $10.98. So for I don't people know what out there, is. CPM is cost per 1000 impressions, so cost per 1000 views for every 1000 views on that video, he will on average get $10. So if you do the math, 500 times the 1,000 times 10, actually, that's a lot of money. Oh, uh, this is gonna this is gonna hurt me a lot. I actually haven't added up how much that video was worth that I threw away all that money. So if, if I'm adding, I mean, if oh, it's a $10 CPM, you're probably looking at five or six thousand dollars, right? Six thousand four hundred seventy-eight dollars. Yeah, and that's I threw away six thousand four hundred seventy-eight dollars for thirty seconds of a Jaws theme. Hey, Brett, we appreciate we appreciate the Jaws theme. I promise. Yeah, so so that's <laughs> that's the stuff you look at as a YouTube creator. When you're putting up big numbers like that, the AdSense start to make an impact on it. When you are just beginning, I would not mind yourself with that with that kind of petty amount of money because it's not going to push the needle forward for you. When you get to Brett's level, maybe it's something to consider. Okay, that video though. I, I want to talk about like a lot of different things that you do in your videos when you're creating your videos. First off, like the thumbnail was just so simple. The title was just beautifully done. How I, I want to I want to go through like your process on these things, because most of your thumbnails are very clean. They're crispy. They're one player. They're one or two like pieces of text with some sort of, you know, like witty line and a, and a crisp background with stripes. It's very, very clean. It's very simple. You see it and you know exactly what you're going in for. How much time do you put into the thumbnails? Like what is, what's the, the, I guess, inspiration behind like the thumbnails and, you know, have you thought about like pivoting to new thumbnails or what's the ideas behind these? I've been kind of experimenting with different thumbnails over the last, I don't know, six months or so, just like different, because I, I wanted to see like what a more simplistic thumbnail that's still eye catching, but also more simplistic with kind of like a, a different style of title, like would that perform better? And so the Tevin Jenkins episode 
was the ultimate test of that, of like literally just putting his face up there with a title that both makes sense to the content, but is also like, in my opinion, just pretty funny. Just looking at the guy's face. It's 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 like and it's yeah, a viral it, title. It, it's a viral title, bro. Everything about it. It seemed when I saw the thumbnail, I was like, yeah, either like he's a mad genius or he had to run out of the house and he was like, let me just fucking upload a picture from Google of this guy real quick. <laughs> That's what I was like deciding. Between Which I have. I have done that before, by the way, where it's like, I got to get to LAX for a flight. I'm uploading a video that I can publish from my phone, but I have no thumbnail. Let me just throw something on there. And then when I get to the hotel, I'll make something on the lap. Like I've done that before. Yeah. The the first Carson Wentz video I did like a couple of years ago, like I uploaded that and then literally walked out the door to go on my honeymoon. Jeez. And then I actually hit publish from from Paris. It probably paid for your honeymoon. Oh, see, that's what's annoying is I got a, one of those like fake copyright strikes from somebody who just claimed and I had to like while on my honeymoon go through the process of filing an appeal. And and okay. it, f by the time I got back, it you know, the video got up. But like, yeah, like when I landed, you know, hit publish and everything like that. And then I woke up the next day and the video was gone. And so like I on the, like, the first actual day in Europe for my honeymoon, like that's what I was dealing with. So you know it's just part of the job like i the marshawn Lattimore episode his rookie year i finished like the day before i got married <laughs> like you know i was i was working 60 hours in like four days to get that one done because then i had to go get married later that week because i was an idiot and booked a sponsor the week of my wedding like a dumbass like i've i've done a lot of long weeks on this channel with that really video like that takes you 60 deadlines. hours see that well the Lattimore one might have been about 50 quarterback ones can take 60 to 70 the the Lattimore one was probably about 50 if that's, I remember correctly that's wild but yeah yeah I I'll I'll work on average 60 hours a week yeah I, most, I don't most weeks. I don't doubt that at all I want to break that down a little further but I want to get back to the thumbnails and the designs a little bit because this is so important to people on YouTube thumbnails and the titles are arguably you know outside of the actual content itself you got to bring people into the content now you come from like a semi-creative background. Do you have any experience like in design or, cause one thing I've noticed, like when I first started doing stuff that was like brand focused and started making designs, whether it was for YouTube or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, is like, I'm terrible at designing shit. The more I tried to do with designs, the worse it got. So I've always thought like, you know, the more simplistic, the, the less you do, the more you do when it comes to designs. So I'm, I'm curious if there's any like takeaways that you've learned over the years of doing your own designs, if you had a design background at all, or like what you would say to people that are starting, like, you know, figuring out the direction of, of what they should do with their thumbnails. I have always been of the belief that simplicity and readability is key. Like, it, you know, it's got to be eye catching. So you want to put an image of the player you're talking about and something like that. So I always put like a cutout image that I do in Photoshop. Like I do all my thumbnails in Photoshop and like, I want to have something that ties every single thumbnail together so that people just, just seeing it know that it's me. So like mm -hmm. that kind of like stripey background and everything like that is, is like the thing that I carry over just with different colors and everything like that. So it's like that tells people right off the top that they know it's me. Although I've seen some other creators basically use that exact same thumbnail format with like the same stripey background now. So that's part of the reason why I'm trying to change things up is because people are still like basically copying my thumbnails at this point for some reason. But for some reason, because you're pulling you said, off fucking <laughs> 250, 300,000 views. I could, I could tell you the reason 300,000 of them. True. You're right, though, that like simplicity and th like I, the, the number one mistake that I see people do with thumbnails is they do overcomplicated titles. And they do overcomplicated thumbnail. They just throw throw stuff on there. Like it's just a, a hodgepodge of images and symbols and texts and emojis and somebody's face going like this, bro. For some reason, it, I hate that. I hate that. Arrows, so circles. It's it, like that. That kind of thumbnail style like worked on YouTube maybe like four or five years ago. But now I think you have to be more discerning with your thumbnails. You have to make it look more aesthetically pleasing, and not just a shotgun approach so it's like just put the put the player put a couple words if you want to sometimes you don't even need to like with the Tevin jenkins one i didn't mean to i just had to put his face and that's all all you needed like that that video would not have done well if i used like a normal cutout video of tevin jenkins with him in a helmet mm -hmm. and words and like it had to be just his face and so like as you said less is more and for people that are trying to figure out thumbnails and titles like don't bother putting like i made this mistake a long time ago don't bother putting like episode 50 blah 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 blah, blah. like put it put a title that's actually 
interesting, like almost like a, a headline of an article. It, it makes something that's that's eye catching, title wise, simplistic, thumbnail wise. And uh, I think that's a mistake that a lot of people that are new to the space make is they think they just have to cram every piece of information from the video into the title and thumbnail. It's like you don't. Just make something enticing. Give it a little teaser, but that's about it. Yeah, that's that's one of the first mistakes I see often where people are like, oh, can you check out my channel and see what I'm doing wrong? Always, immediately the title is 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 like, oh, uh, Roto, Roto something fantasy football episode 42. And then it'll be like running back rankings or something like that. I'm like, bro, you got to understand that people on YouTube are searching for things. They don't know who you are. They don't care what episode number it is. They don't care what the name of your show is. They want the title. Most You, you got to think of it almost like a in a how-to sense, right? Like the sports stuff is not how-to, but the way people are searching for it and the way people want instant satisfaction to whatever they're looking for is in like a how-to nature. So you want to tell them exactly what they're clicking on for the title. I think you do a great job of like, you know, not making it spammy, not making it corny. You have like the, the, the couple words on the actual thumbnail itself are never like, they're not clickbaity. There's always a little bit of wit to it. And then you tie it in with the title so well. I mean, you're you're in the space of football, so the audience is like really, really large, right? So I guess you have a little bit more wide of a net than someone in the fantasy football space, but you still have to have stuff that's like SEO related that will bring in a new audience. So you can't be like super niche with the title, super niche with the thumbnails. How do you go about like deciding what you think is like too niche that might be like a little too funny or clever that won't actually bring people in? What's your thought process on, on like titles and things like that? So I, I think it just, it depends on what the subject is. So like back in August, you know, when I was doing like my one fantasy episode of the year, like straight up fantasy episode mm -hmm. where it was like my 10 favorite sleepers for the season. And like the, the title and thumbnail was literally the 10 best fantasy football sleepers of 2020. No mention of like what the title of my channel was like, it was just, here's the 10 best sleepers. So the people that are YouTubing, or that are searching fantasy football sleepers that will pop up. And the thumbnail was just a picture of Chase Claypool and 2020 fantasy rankings. So that told everybody that that was looking for that, what that was all about. It was about sleepers. You had a picture of a promising rookie who thank God ended up doing well. So I didn't look like an idiot and, and rankings. And I used that video to promote my main fantasy rankings over on Patreon. And so again, you want to like tie different revenue streams in together and stuff like that. But then one week or two weeks later, something a little bit more cheeky was when Russell Wilson was popping off in the first couple of weeks of the season. That was when like, you know, the let Russ cook movement was at its all time high. So the title of the video was the Seahawks finally let Russ cook and it's working. And so, again, a little bit more of a cheeky title. I put a picture of Russ with like a chef hat and everything like that. Still simple, still clean. My, it's like my main thumbnail style, but then something a little bit like cheeky with the chef hat and stuff like that for let Russ cook. So. It just kind of depends on what the subject is for like, you know, how straight laced you want to be with it versus how kind of like funny and witty you want to be with it. And it's just kind of like a feel thing, like for what the subject of the episode is. And each individual creator will have to uh, determine that for themselves. But when you do it long enough, I think you start to do kind of develop a feel for for when you have to do things straight and when you can do things a little bit more funny. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you you know your industry, you know, when things kind of like, for instance, like fantasy football is really, really, really popular for about a four week period from the end of August into early September. And like, you know, you got to have your shit straight, you know, tons of people are going to be searching for it. So maybe, you know, in July or June or something, you might put up like a funny title that's more enticing for your already audience, like the people that know you that people that want to mm -hmm. click on the title. But when August 31st rolls around, and you want to throw out your running back rankings, or you want to throw out something that you know, is going to put up big numbers, you want to make sure it's clear to the people that are searching for you, because that's when the growth is at its all time high. So yeah, I mean, you pick and choose your battles. Again, I think it comes down to ex experimenting, like, like Brett said, also, you know, I think, I mean, Brett was like, people are kind of like stealing my designs and shit. I do think it's it's worth going to other people's channels and not necessarily stealing the fucking design, but realizing what about the thumbnail that you like, whether it's it being clean or whether it's the different like color schemes or the different shadows within the picture itself. I think those are things that you learn. The little nuances to these images are things that you learn along the way because you're going to start trying to do a thumbnail. You'll cut out a player. You're going to throw it on like a, a blue background or something. And you're like, why does my... Why does mine look like shit? Why does Brett's look great? And you'll start to look at the little details of it. Maybe he's got like an outline on the player. Maybe he's got a little bit of a blur or, or a shadow behind it. I think those are the little things. And once you figure out what it is that makes an image pop or what it is that makes an image clean, 
go Google it. How do I put a shadow behind a player? How do I put a shadow behind text or something in Photoshop? And those are, that's how those things come together. It's yeah, like, it, those, those are fine. It's when you use like literally like the same stripes, like same font. That's when it's like, man, come on. Like, do, do you have to like my, I, <laughs> my boy, my boy Noah is going to be pissed like, if I if I don't mention this. You're hitting. I think it was like a Pokemon thumbnail. You know what I'm talking about? Like the last couple of weeks. I yeah. think it was like a hidden one. He put that up first and he was he was going to fucking rat you out to YouTube in the NFL, bro. Did he? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even see. Oh, now I feel bad. Now I feel like an asshole. I, I believe I didn't you even did, see that. I believe you didn't take it, but I know he'd be fucking pissed if I didn't bring it up. Oh, God. Now I got to make a new one. They're beautiful and they work. So that's that's what I'm talking about. If something works, go steal it from me, from Brett, from from Noah. It doesn't matter. It all works. What else works is your fucking camera quality. I need to I need to ask you about the setup you got going on there because, like I said, it's extremely crispy. Is this all stuff that you learned being in film, being at the NFL Network, how to set up the lighting, the different lenses to use on the camera, all that kind of stuff? Because I have no idea how to work with lighting. Like right now, I just have like a window next to me that's glaring on my face and I have like a shitty light up here and it looks okay because you can't see the rest of my room. But lighting is something that I've struggled with mightily. Do you think that production quality is a really big deal today on YouTube or do you think you just like having it because you come from a job that had such high production quality? I never really intended to be on camera really. I wasn't like super big into that idea. I've always been a behind the camera kind of guy, but I saw JT O'Sullivan's channel, the QB school. I don't know if you watch him at all, but like he just has this beautiful on camera setup that it's even better than mine. Like I will, I will never look as good as JT does. And like with the bokeh and like the slight vignette on the lens and his, his color correction is incredible and i saw that and i was like man like i i think that's the direction that that this space is going because right now i mean there's a million channels that are just straight up voiceover with felt mm -hmm. like when when i started i don't really know of any that were around when i started but now four year four or five years later there's i can think of 20 off the top of my head it's a very common format and so i was like i gotta differentiate myself and JT at the time was one of the only like football guys that I, I saw was like doing on camera stuff and then kind of splicing in film. And I was like, you know what? He's ahead of the curve on this. I'm also going to get on camera because he's different than everybody else right now. So I'm going to be different than the herd as well. And there's still mostly people that just do voiceover and not on cam. I think eventually there's going to be a lot more people on like you're on cam. You're one of the main fantasy people, I would say, on YouTube, and you're on cam, and it works amazingly well for you guys. But for like pure like football, like like football film YouTube, it's not done as much. So I I think it kind of helps differentiate me from the other, you know, couple dozen film channels out there of just having like being able to put a face to a voice, being able to connect to my audience, being able to like show off my personality and like my cats and you know my alcohol that i drink which i actually i when i first started drinking on camera it was literally just to manage nerves <laughs> like i i and not that I'm not, I'm not like an alcoholic or anything like i literally only i pretty much only drink like once or twice a week but i would pour myself a drink to help manage nerves because i really didn't want to be on camera but i recognized that i had to be in order for the channel to survive and to grow and to adapt and you know to match the quality of other channels out there like jt so i was like i, I have to do this you know, if I if I have something in my hand, like a glass of whiskey that I can sip, like it'll make me feel better. I'll be able to get through it. Uh, and then it, that just kind of became part of the brand as well and just kind of further differentiated me from the rest of football film YouTube. And there's a lot of extraordinarily talented, you know, football film guys out there. You know, Sam Gold, Alex Rollins, Sanjit Tor, who does mostly Raiders stuff, but he does draft stuff, too. Like there's there's a lot of extremely talented football YouTubers that are only voice, only film. I was like, I got to make sure that people know that I'm separate from them. So I think it's a it's a willingness to adapt, a willingness to change, a willingness to become an entirely different format over and over again throughout a YouTuber's career that allows them to have longevity powerful shit there at the end. You got you got goosebumps going on me right there. Yeah, dude, <laughs> it, it really is all about pivoting and seeing what works when you're experimenting video seems to be like 
the it thing right now. There's a reason why there are now 20 channels, 50 channels, 100 channels doing fantasy and doing football because the organic growth is so is just so almost viral to a point right now compared to the other networks, compared to the other platforms, things like that. And you're seeing a lot of the big companies kind of scurry to get to YouTube and make the impact that, you know, individual creators like myself and, and Brett have hopefully had on on the audience and, you know, fortunately been able to grow audiences through video. And it's just another way of, I don't even think it's another way. I think it like is the way of branding nowadays. People want to see you. They want to know, you know, what you're about. They want to know what you look like. They want to know the clothes that you wear. Like you said, the cats, like they want to know all about you. And that's the way you separate yourself. If you're just talking over a video, all they remember is informational stuff. All they remember is the actual football itself. When you're on camera, they might not even remember what you're saying, but if they can remember who you are, like that's always going to leave an impression onto them. And they're, they're going to relate to you. It, it, it really, at the end of the day, when people listen to stuff, they want to relate to you, whether it's the actual content itself. And what video does is opens up another way for people to relate to you. It's like, oh, Nick's a, you know, Nick's a mid twenties kid. Like he relates to me. He's the same age as I am. You know, Brett likes X, Y, Z, like he has the same things that I do. So I think it opens up another avenue just to be relatable to people. And at the end of the day, like that's how content creators get big. And that's how they create a foundation of, of what they're doing. Yeah. Like when I'm doing dishes or like I'm cleaning, you know, my house or something like that, I'll throw you guys on just to hear you dick around and, and talk about what running backs you like in 2023. Mm -hmm. Just because like, again, in it's almost like I'm just like I'm in the room and my friends are talking about fantasy football in the corner and I'm just doing like that's the kind of feel that it is. And it's a different kind of feel than if it was just nameless, faceless podcast. It's a different kind of connection. And so I think your audience can relate to that as well, because the fact that you guys do so much on camera stuff, it's as you said, it's less about who you guys like at running back. And it's more so about here's these guys that I know their personality and also they're talking about football which I think is the key to long-term, not just subscriber growth, but subscriber loyalty. Like, have you ever heard of the thousand true fans theory? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where it's better to have a thousand true fans than a hundred thousand kind of like passive fans, because those thousand true fans are going to stick with you forever. And so that's the goal is get those thousand true fans and then try to get a thousand true fans on top of that over and over and over again. Like, fuck the big numbers. Get the small numbers because the small numbers are going to be there forever. Yeah, Brett's sitting over here, 300,000. Fuck the big numbers. No, he, he, <laughs> very, 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 very true. When you're starting out, like the, the single best thing you could do is not look forward, but to look at the people that are there for you right now because one person turns into two, two turns into three, three turns into six. Before you know it, those fucking loyal people are 100 deep. They're 1,000 deep. And like you said, like we're in a world where you have to pivot all the time and you have to experiment. So when you do that, you don't want the bottom to fall out underneath you, right? If you don't have a loyal following behind you and you want to, if I wanted to start talking about marketing stuff like this and business and industry stuff like this, and no one gave a shit about what I had to say, like that would be disheartening. But the fact that like you guys relate to me on a personal level lets you continue to, you know, listen to me doing stuff like this that I'm passionate about. So it, it allows you the the flexibility to pivot, not just from a content perspective, but experimenting with, with other pieces of, of content and different industries and just different things on camera, like anything you really want to do at the end of the day. Yeah. Like travel stuff. <laughs> like I, I eventually want to do travel and cooking. I mean, I didn't get to do any travel last season, but I'm definitely going to do a lot of travel this season. I'm going to vlog it. Like it's going to be like NFL based travel, like going to stadiums around the country and stuff like that. And I'm going to vlog it because I can, and I think it's going to be fun and not all of my audience will be into it, but a fraction of them will. And I'm excited for that because in the end that those are the people that stick with you. Yeah. A, a fraction of them will. And that fraction will become like exponentially more loyal to you just from that single piece of content. So you know who to hit up when you get on the East Coast, Brett. You, you know where we're going. We're going to see the fucking the shitty Jets, the shitty Giants. I'll travel down the coast if we need to. We can go see Atlanta. We can get some redemption for the bullshit that you brought up in the beginning of the of the video. Go see. Have, have you been to have you been to their stadium? By I have the way? not been to the new stadium yet. Oh, well, my little cousin goes to, to to Georgia, though, so I'm probably going to make a trip down there to see a Bulldogs game uh, this fall and then probably catch the Falcons play. I heard it's incredible. I'll, I'll go with you. I'll go with you because I love I love the Atlanta area. You go grab an Airbnb up on Lake Lanier. It's like 45 minutes to an hour outside. It's gorgeous. You go to a Bulldog game. I went to a Falcons game uh, Lamar's rookie year, and I saw the, the Ravens play in Atlanta. And like, dude, it's a, a it's a gorgeous stadium, but B... It's a transcendent experience to see Lamar Jackson play live. I'll just say that.
That's fair. I'm gonna hold you to that. We're going. We're one thousand percent now going to a Falcons game this year. Okay. I'm I'm curious. You know, more back to like the video stuff. I actually I want to know like what kind of equipment you're working with. What kind of camera do you use? What kind of lens do you got set up over there? Not now, obviously, but when you're doing your individual mm. stuff. Yeah. So I use a Sony A7R three. Okay. Which is a really nice mirrorless camera, and I got. Sony, even though I shot Canon before for most of my life, including at film school, like I learned to shoot on DSLRs and everything like that. I had a, a T2, but I got Sony because it does super slow-mo in 1080p, which I mean, well, you know, a couple of years ago, that was like a thing that wasn't super common. Now it is among camera bodies, but like, I'm still going to stick with this one for a few more years and then I'll probably up, upgrade to, you know, something new and fancy in a few years. But the fact that it does super slow-mo in 1080p was big for me for like B-roll sequences and stuff like that. I can shoot in like gorgeous, like 24 frames. Like, so when I, when I shoot my video, like of, of me, like sitting at the kitchen table and stuff like that, that's in 24 frames per second, which is like a, a more cinematic frame rate. It's a little mm -hmm. bit more like buttery and smooth and soft and everything like that. Like when you watch movies in a theater, that's all shot in 24 frames. A lot of people shoot in like 60 frames per second for YouTube, which is fine. Like you can do that, but I almost feel like it's too HD and like too clean and too crisp. And it's, it's almost like weird to the eye sometimes. So I shoot in 24 because it just kind of makes people feel like they're watching a, a movie and I'll shoot on either a 50 mil lens or a 28 to 70 telephoto. And I'll kind of dial it in with that. It just kind of depends. Like the 50 mil, I think is like a really good portrait lens. So it's got really nice bokeh on it for the background. Boca, for those that don't know, is like the ability to kind of blur the background, but then keep the subject in focus. So the subject looks really sharp and the background is kind of separated. I used to shoot a lot during the day, but I felt like with my three piece lighting kit where I have a key, a fill and then a backlight, I felt like it looked better at night, especially because I could put the lanterns in the back to kind of give the room depth. Like that's another thing is you want to have like depth in your background. You don't want to just be like right in front of a wall like I am now, <laughs> but so you, you put lights back there. And so the darkness with the, like the little pops of lights give depth. And then you got your lighting kit. You got the bokeh to also isolate the subject. The lens itself is nice. The camera itself is nice. Uh, and then you color correct that in Adobe Premiere. And I can actually, I'll, I'll DM you like a really good video about how to basically turn like any camera into a really nice cinematic look like you could take cool. a 300 dollars camera and, and get the same look but color correction is key because I'll, I'll shoot in kind of like a flat color profile and then color that in premiere and then in the end you're left with the image that i have which i think is a pretty good image it could be better like jt's is still way better i don't know what he shoots on or, or what his color correction is his is amazing uh but i hope to eventually get as good as his one day i mean yours is like top top nine and we're talking about like running a four three one right now that's where that's where your camera <laughs> system is right now among the the football and the fantasy football landscape most people don't even know where to start most people are using the webcam which is fine i typically you know most people you don't need a mirrorless camera to start you don't need a dslr i usually point them to like a, a logitech webcam one that shoots preferably 4k but 1080p will work if you're close and you have decent lighting i've always like kind of struggled between doing the natural daylight, which is probably easier for me to do and actually setting up like a, a studio. I tend to be like on the move a lot too. So it's difficult for me to have, you know, cause we have like a studio here where me and my friends film and then I have my individual studio here. So lighting gets a little bit difficult for me, but that's something I've, I, I, I need to start working on a little bit more. I'm thinking about like not upping the budget per se, but like upping the production quality of the videos like i really like what you have going on over there and i'm thinking about experimenting a little bit this summer with a more like cinematic look for the videos i always just feel like i like people seeing my background and stuff and just seeing you know when this is widescreen my, my lens right now is widescreen so they see basically my entire apartment and for the most part like for better or worse it's just a shit show and i'm like oh half of me is like oh you know what they can kind of relate to that a little bit more but half of me is also like this is wildly unprofessional and probably super annoying to the naked eye of people watching me. And I'm just like, I don't really know what to think, but it's always just been the way I operated. With that specific point of like, you know, having like a messy apartment or, or just a normal, per, normal looking apartment or anything like that. That's the conundrum where you're making content for two different audiences. The one that's already following you and the one that has no idea who you are. Yeah. The one that's already following you wouldn't even care. They'd find it endearing. The one that's not already following you that doesn't know who you are would be like, why, why is he showing me his whole apartment right now? 
So it's it's a tough balance because again, it's like, am I making content for the thousand true fans or am I making content for the next hundred thousand that might become a thousand? So it, I, you should see the shit show behind the camera in my kitchen yeah. when I'm recording. Yeah. But I tend to clean up a little bit just to like make it a little bit more, what's the word? I mean, so your wife allows you to continue doing it? Yeah, basically. Also, I will say like biggest tip and you, you're you already set on this area. Biggest thing I learned in film school, video quality is great, but that's the sauce, not the meat. The meat is audio quality. There is a reason why the Blair Witch Project made so much money even though it was shot on camcorders. It was and that's because the sound design. Right? What, but it was terrifying because the sound design. The sound design was incredible. And the human brain and the human ear responds to sound in a much more emotionally dominant way than the eyes do. Like the brain is more connected to the ears than to the eyes for most human beings. Like in the sense of if, there, if there's really good sound design, in a horror film, you're going to shit your pants compared to if there's really good visual special effects. So always prioritizing good audio quality is the first step because people will watch a YouTube video longer if it looks like shit but sounds like gold than if it looks like gold but sounds like shit. That's the biggest thing I can tell people starting a, out in this space. It's a very good audio point. First. The first two years I made videos, I didn't even have a microphone. I like actually had a camera. I didn't have anything besides probably my laptop microphone. And I think part of me like didn't know I should have been using a microphone. Part of me was also just like, like, fuck the man. I don't need a microphone. I can grow an audience like while doing a shitty video from my bedroom in my mom's house. But I've certainly, as you could see using the shore right now, I've gotten a little bit more bougie with the, the quality and the production. And it's something that I've come around to telling people that are starting off in the space, asking about quality production. Five years ago, I would have told you it doesn't matter. Content is king. As long as you're really, really good, you have a lot of value to give and you could present it well, you'll do well. It's too saturated for that now. And I think the point that you made with deciding between the two audiences is like very, very real. And I think about that sometimes. I think it would be like off brand for me to just start worrying about bringing in new subscribers and shit. But part of me wants to you know, clean it up a little bit and make sure the audio is up to par and make sure the video is up to par and, and kind of, you know, just again, experiment and see where it goes. And like you said, as long as the first a thousand people are there and loyal to you, like to give yourself the leverage to experiment a little bit. So I would say, yes, production quality probably at a minimum needs to be presentable. And I, I listen to, I probably have like 10 or 15, po <laughs> I probably have like 10 or 15 podcasts in rotation. And as soon as this someone, they have like a guess. Oh, she's beautiful. <laughs> What's a uh, he, her? Yeah, it's his name is Little, even though he's gigantic. I love that. <laughs> was, was he was he little when you named him, or was he just fat from the rib? He was very small when I named him, and now he's a monster. What are you feeding <laughs> that thing? Just kibble, I swear to God. But he's like <laughs> the biggest cat you've ever seen. I swear to God. I like fat cats. I don't like cats in general, but if I'm going to like a cat, it's got to be a fat one. That's like my rule. Of thumb. <laughs> it's actually my rule of thumb with like all pets and animals. What was I What was I going off on a tangent about? Yeah, I just think the production quality needs to be at a minimum, like pretty well. If I'm listening to a podcast that I typically like in rotation and they have a guest on and their audio is like terrible, I'm like, ah, fuck this. You know, I don't, I don't really want to listen to it. It actually like hurts. It's interesting that you said that, that we are, we're more perceptive to the ear than the eye. I would have just naively thought about it the other way. And I think like video is more important than audio. I guess you've got the numbers and the facts and the, and the fat cats to, to back it up. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I, I noticed such a big difference in quality when I got this mic. This is a Rode NTG3, by the way, since you were asking about my setup earlier. I use this Rode NTG3, which is also my podcast mic. And I'll hook this into an XLR cable that goes mm -hmm. into a uh, portable recorder that records onto an SD. Exactly. Just like that. Yeah. And then I'll bring, I'll bring that audio into Adobe Premiere, sync it up to the video. So I never use the camera audio. Mm -hmm. I always use the audio from this mic and then sync it up in post okay. so that I get the best possible audio quality. Yeah, we've had to experiment a lot with that because we do shows with, you know, once you do it with multiple people, you, you have to have a little bit different of a setup with some kind of audio interface and um, whatnot. Is that now, how high quality is that mic? Is that mic like a really professional mic? Like, is that above the Shure SM7B? It's, let's see, when I got it, it was about 600 bucks. 
Okay. This so is like I would say it's like mid tier. I mean, when you look at microphones, like that is a mid tier microphone. Like some of the really high quality, high, high, high quality stuff is like twelve hundred, fifteen hundred, even five thousand. So I would say it's like the next step up from like a Yeti Blue, which is probably like the main mic that most people start out with. I hate those so much. I I use that for like a probably a good year, a year and a half, and then upgraded to this and what you know what, what sucks is when you move over to the dynamic mic so there's the usb and there's the dynamic the usb is a usb plug plugs right into your computer super easy but the quality is lower once you move over to the dynamic mic people are like yo how much does it cost for the shore smb i'm like retails for 400 but then you got to get the xlr which plugs into a cloud lifter which is another buck 50 and then another xlr which plugs into the audio interface which is like another 200 dollars. if you want to do multiple people you got to get a bigger audio interface all is said and done you're you know you're dropping a pretty like 800 to to four figures on just this mic setup so i wouldn't say it's necessary from the start but just make sure you could probably get like a usb mic for 100 120 dollars. that's like 70 oh, yeah. percent of dynamic mics for sure yeah and that's again you want to scale your equipment with the size of your business like don't mm -hmm. don't immediately try to go all out with super professional equipment and putting all this money in like when you haven't really done anything with the channel yet and you haven't really grown yet i almost feel like it's better for a young youtuber to start out just like you and me with shitty equipment and shitty videos like i go back and look at the stuff i made at the beginning it's awful it, it, it's terrible but you have to make terrible videos to be able to make great videos. Like even when I started doing on cam, I wasn't using these mics yet. I was trying to use camera audio because I didn't have like a mic interface yet that I felt like was good enough. And I, again, I was like experimenting. So like I go back to my early on cam stuff and like the color corrections terrible, the audio is terrible, but you have to make terrible stuff to be able to make the good stuff. And that's part of the journey. So don't try to go all in on professional equipment, spending thousands of dollars all at once, like spend that money over years and years and years to incrementally get better so that you can maximize that equipment in the long run rather than just trying to skip over the hard parts of the process. Bro, like, and that's the thing. It needs to be a natural progression. The, the hard part, like those shitty parts in the beginning, the shitty equipment is like, it's part of the process that you have to love. Like you have to think that what you're doing at the time is good. And then you'll look back on it in three years and be like, wow, that was terrible. But at the time, it's like the best you have. And I'm sure I'm going to look back on this video in four years and be like, what the fuck was that camera set up? Like, what was the lighting in the background there? You know? <laughs> like, that's how it works. But that's the fun part about it, man. If you're not in love with the process of, of just what you have in front of you and just loving the raw creative mindset that you have at the time, like the tools, that kind of shit, upgrading, buying stuff is just... It's, it's it's a fucking fugazi, man. You you tell yourself excuses as to why you're not exceeding, but it really is all about the natural climb. And that goes back to like the audience too, man. Like you, I see a lot of people on social media now, especially with like this whole like TikTok blow up trend of people really, you know, I, I, I hate to say that some people blow up overnight because a lot of the times people who get really large followings do a lot of work for a really long time before they hit some sort of like exponential marker and then blow up. But with a platform like TikTok, TikTok that's so uh, organically uh, exploding, there are people who blow up immediately. And then I'm like, I don't know what they're going to do because their their following is not loyal. They're going to go right back to where they started from as quickly as they came up. So as, as, as long as it takes you to get to a point of success, that's how long it'll take you to, to fall down. So if you get there really quickly by cheating and cutting corners, it's going to be the same fucking corners that you slide down on the way down. Yeah. I mean, I have close to 300,000 subscribers right now, but that's over the course of five years. There's some people that get 300 K in like two months and it's almost like bad for them I agree. in a way, because yeah. as you said, like it's there, it's, it's a more fickle, like some people can hold on to that. Don't get me wrong. Especially like in the music space, like music, I think is a little bit different than most, but like, a vlogger that gets like 300k in two months there's a there's a lot of difficulties that go with that because you have to like almost accelerate your growth and development process because you feel like you're scaling up at such a faster pace than normal and you like haven't some, gone through the struggles either so like it normally you haven't gone if, through the struggles it takes yet. you six years to get somewhere at one point or another you've fucked up just about every part of your process so if something were to fall through the fucking hole you know oh, okay like i gotta do this in order to get back to here if you do that overnight and then something happens like you don't have 
any leash. Your leash is short because your following is so big. It happens so rapidly. Like they want it fixed ASAP and you don't have the experience to know what to do there. You have to make mistakes when you're small because then nobody sees them. But if you start making mistakes when you're big, because you ha you haven't made the mistakes yet, you just get big before you get to make mistakes. And I'm not talking to like legal mistakes. I'm talking like production mistakes, pacing mistakes, scheduling mistakes, like just the normal stuff that YouTubers mess up on naturally because we're all human and nobody really knows how to do this. Like there's no guidebook to it. Everybody has to just collectively learn from their own mistakes. If you start making mistakes when you're big because you didn't get to make them when you're small, those mistakes get magnified and the consequences are so much worse. And because those subscribers haven't been around for five years and they've only been around for two months, it's a lot easier for them to just never come back. So it's, I, I think slow, steady growth is so much better long-term, not just for channel growth, but I also think for like mental health too. Mm -hmm. Like people like look at like 300K and they're like, oh, I, I hope I get to that number and, and, and everything like that. Where it's like in my head, I still feel like I have like 50K because it's such a small, like I still feel like a small channel, even though like I'm one of the bigger NFL channels out there that isn't owned by the league itself or its sports network itself. So apologize for the cat. It's all good. I love but it. But like I, you know, I don't feel like a big channel because I grew slow. And so I think it's it's better for for like a, a mentality wise to not blow up overnight because yeah, it's, I, it just causes so many problems. Yeah, it's a mindset thing. I've said this many, many times on this series before, but it's like when you're starting out those milestones and benchmarks that you hit at the beginning feel just as good as the same ones that me or Brett will hit. Like when Brett hits 325,000, it'll, it'll feel the same way that you feel about hitting your first hundred subscribers. It's just, it, it's really all mm -hmm. relative to where you're at. So these numbers are things you can't look too far ahead. That's where you start getting fucked up mentally. But if you could take it day by day and really enjoy the process, you could look at the numbers, but don't get unrealistic with them. If you could look at the numbers in a realistic manner and be like oh this is the next thing that i could actually accomplish within the next month or whatever it is you'll 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 clear your head a lot a lot more safely and, and won't be you know putting yourself through a bunch of fucking headaches going forward okay i think the the biggest thing is that people like expect the money to be there immediately i was negative money for like the first year it's like 10 10 months i didn't i was negative money if you go into YouTube expecting to make a shitload of money, you're, you're gonna be already, severely disappointed. you already lost. Yeah, you already lost. If you're if you're not getting into it just because you love the actual art of like creating and, and talking about what you're actually talking about, you're you're gonna get burnt out like very very quickly. If if it's about the money, guess what? You're not gonna you're not gonna make money on YouTube by wanting to make money. That's just not the way it works. Like that yeah. shit comes secondary. Like I yeah, I didn't try to sell a single thing on my YouTube channel for probably like two and a half years of of creating product, and even then it wasn't like to try to make money. It was like oh. I'm going to organize something for you that I've worked so hard on and I spent so much time doing it that I guess I could ask for money and like hopefully people would want to. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to try to make money now. Let me sell them a product. While we're on the subject, though, I do want to talk about monetization a little bit because as a bigger channel, you know, you give yourself a lot of opportunities. You give yourself a lot of leverage to be creative with monetization. And it's a very real part of it. Like once you actually do establish yourself and realize that this could be a lifestyle for you and realize you could build a business around it, that's when the fun begins because you're not just gonna be getting paid from AdSense. AdSense and, and the advertisements that are on your actual YouTube channel, yes, if you hit it big and, and almost throw up a fucking million view video like Brett did, you can make some change from it, but how often, you can't you can't be depending on that for your income. So you look at other ways to do it. You sell products straight to your, to your audience. You could sell merch. You can use subscription services like Patreon. So Brett, I kinda wanna ask you, you know, what are your what have you been focusing on when it comes to monetization? Do you have like a very strict like three or four avenues that bring in money for you? Because when I first started, I was all over the place trying so many different ideas. Now I've come to the to the point where we have like probably three or four really, really, you know, clear paths where we make money and we just try to improve those things year over year. So I think it's similar to the mistakes uh, when people like kind of try to skip the hard parts and they they want to get the the good equipment and everything immediately like i added one revenue source at a time over the course of 5 years if you immediately jump into trying to have seven revenue sources which is like you know what people say you should do like if, if you're like on youtube like have seven revenue sources if i immediately jumped into that i get way overwhelmed so at first it was just 
Google ad revenue, which is super unreliable, especially for us because of we use footage and most of our videos get demonetized. So, like I don't even rely on Google ad money. Mm-hmm. That's why like I wasn't like super butthurt about the Tevin Jenkins thing, you know, losing me. I don't know that much. I don't money know if I believe because right. I didn't. You're hurt. You're hurt. No, I didn't expect I it. to. I'm trust me, I'm hurting, but I didn't <laughs> expect to get that money anyway. Because I was like, inevitably, it's going to be claims. So like, I didn't really like care that much about using the Jaws theme because I was like, well, either they take the money or the NFL takes the money or XOS takes the money. Like, I was like, whatever, I'm not going to get this money anyway. So I'll throw it in there. Still hurts, but that was my mentality. <laughs> so like I see Google ad money as like just a bonus. My main revenue sources are brand deals, which is what pays the mortgage for me. That's why like I don't care about how much footage I use or what music I use because the brand deals allow me to do that. Patreon, you know, which I really got to get better at posting more on Patreon, especially like Patreon specific stuff to reward those people that, that, you know, are giving me money every single month just to support the channel. And like, they, they've been like the backbone since I first started. Like I was getting Patreon money before I was getting brand deal money. Like that is what allowed me to buy top ramen when I was living on an air mattress in a bonus room in my future in-laws house to try to make it on YouTube, like that Patreon money was my income. And so like that's that's been there the longest. The biggest is brand deals. Second biggest is probably Patreon. Third is merch, which I just started doing probably in the last six or seven months because I finally felt like I had a strong enough brand to do it, like a strong enough following to do it like enough people that cared about me, the person to support me through merch sales. Like before that, again, when I was like a nameless, faceless voice on a video, like I didn't really feel like I had a strong enough brand presence to even think about merch. Once I started getting on camera and like connecting with my audience on a more personal level, I felt like, okay, maybe I can, maybe people that don't want to do Patreon or maybe people that like, you know, don't want to support in other ways, but they still want you know, merch, maybe I can do that because I feel like my audience connection is at a place where I can do that. So I launched that last season, like early in the season or mid season or somewhere around there. Like this is the, this is the hat with my logo that I commissioned a designer to do. Like I'm wearing my, my Steelers hoodie. This is like a series of, of hoodies that I started doing where like, I'll do like the play art for some iconic plays for different NFL teams. And like, I'll put the play call on the sleeve. Like this is the Antonio or Santonio Holmes Super Bowl touchdown against the Cardinals for reference. So that's been a, a, a good kind of like tertiary revenue source for me. I've started doing live streaming lately, which ended up being a, a much better revenue source than I expected it to be, to be honest. Oh yeah. I was, uh, I was checking out the live stream you were on last night, the, the podcast you're the co-host of and you're you're fucking super chats in that thing. I, I was, I'm like, I'm like having seizures over there by how much blue and red and orange and shit is popping up in the <laughs> chat, bro. You, you guys are raking on the super chats. It's, it's a very loyal, loyal audience, which again, it's, it, it's key to build those thousand true fans. Cause those are the people that show up for you. And I, I could not be more grateful for those people because to, uh, they're, they're every, they're the lifeblood of the channel. And they're the lifeblood of the podcast, which is also another revenue source for me that I started last March was a podcast, which is now getting sponsored episodes. And that's been growing exponentially ever since we started doing on cam for that podcast. Ever since we kind of transitioned it from like a traditional just audio only podcast to a video podcast that we also put the audio from that video podcast onto podcast services, Mm -hmm. the listenership has like quintupled just from doing that. Because again, video is king now. So like that's six revenue sources right there. And, you know, I'll, I'll hope to add another one at some point when I could figure out like what it is, but um, just kind of slowly adding those revenue sources over a five year period has allowed me to do that without being completely overwhelmed. And it's also given me the diversity to not, not care when the Tevin Jenkins episode gets demonetized, but it doesn't kill me when it does. Because I have the other only stuff emotionally, to fall back on. Not physically. Only emotionally, <laughs> but at least I can still pay my mortgage. Let's you know, uh like let's, it hurts. I'll I'll cry about it in the shower, but I won't be broke. So I'll take it. You should vlog that. We let's talk about merch a little bit. Let's talk about you just started that like semi recently and now it's a decent revenue stream for you. Now it, it's an interesting spot for you because merch I think works really well with people that have really strong brands. Yours is very strong. And at the same time, the merch that you sell, K 
can be sold to people that have no idea who you are. It works for both of like the perfect things. Like if I were to throw a phrase or something that we say all the time on our channel on a sweatshirt, people that are stumbling onto our shit for the first time would never buy it. But the, the loyal audience members would. You're kind of in a dichotomy where you kind of, you grab both audience members. So you're in a cool spot there, I think, to really capitalize on the merch thing. How do you source your merch? Do you keep inventory on hand or you do drop shipping? We, so I go through my manager who goes through, it's not Printful, it's a different service like Printful, but it's like better quality than Printful because Printful's quality is. Yes, I use, I use Printful and you could, so you could say that again. <laughs> it's it's not super like reliable. And then I do my merch for my podcast. My podcast co-host handles that mostly with like outside of my manager with a separate guy in Vermont who's like phenomenal. And like, so we do pub glasses and stuff like that through him. And we do not keep any merchandise on hand because I don't have the time or the place to store all that stuff. So it's pretty much just uh, DTG and like when you order it, it gets made and then it gets shipped directly from our vendors that make it. Mm -hmm. Like it's made to order basically. And then yeah. it gets sent off through them. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's called drop shipping for anyone that wants to start their own, you know, merch line or whatever. You don't actually have to buy any samples of it. You don't have to hold anything on hand. You don't have to do any shipping of it. Printful is the website that I use. They basically, you just upload a file onto the computer, throw it onto one of their shirts. You literally just like drag it on and then you could throw it up in, into a store. I'll ask Brett off camera. What's the one that he uses? And I'll link that down below afterwards. The live streams are interesting for you because I remember we had talked about it in the DMs a couple months ago after you did one of your first live streams. And you're like, dude, there was like really, it was like a really, really profitable live stream. I don't think you expected it to be like that. Going forward, like one, do you enjoy doing live stream content? And two, are you going to consciously make it more of a piece of your content rotation because either you enjoy it or the money comes in when you do it? Because I can do live streams on Sunday mornings before games and probably pull in maybe, you know, 500 to a thousand dollars a week doing that just off super chats. But I don't really want to do that, to be honest, as, as like spoiled and, and like bougie as that sounds. I'm just like Sunday mornings are times for me to just like relax. If I went out the night before or something, I just like don't want to be berated with fantasy questions after doing the whole week. So I'm curious, like where your head's at now, because I know you haven't done a lot of live streams. I want to say I look back at your channel and it was really only like very recently, maybe like eight to ten. Uh, live streams you've done on, on your personal channel. So like, what's your, what's your approach going forward with live streams? What are you thinking with that? I'm still trying to figure it out because it's so profitable that I can't not, not do it. Like for my own life, like I would be stupid not to do it more. And at the same time, it's also like a great way to connect with my audience. Mm -hmm. Like you, you, you build such a strong connection when you're interacting live with the people that support you. And so like, it's not only good for me financially, it's good for me from like a connecting with my audience standpoint. Like it, it would be career, it would be so irresponsible for my career to not do more live streams. The hard part is finding time to do it. So it's like, I want to be able to get onto a schedule where it's like, I have a live stream day. I have a film room release day. I have my podcast recording and release day. Like that's what that's like my goal for 2021 is to get a workflow where everything comes out at the same time every single week and to get consistency because if i can get that then shit's really going to take off so i'm tr i'm i'm actively trying to find a way to do that because live streams were so good for me and i've only done a few of them i know i'm absolutely going to be live streaming during the entire nfl draft all 3 days Ooh. which i did last year for like 18 hours with ej mm -hmm. and it was we had barely started like a couple weeks in and that was monstrously successful. So I can only imagine what it's going to be like now. And so I'm definitely going to be doing that. And then like spending May, like the month of May where I'm kind of taking things a little bit easy with film rooms. Like I'm only doing like maybe one that month and like having that be my business development month where every single day I'm attacking a certain problem or a certain thing that I want to improve for the upcoming NFL season and spending my time on that rather than making film room episodes, which I love to do, but like I got to get my shit together so that I can make better content this coming season. That's a, that's a great idea. That's, that's typically what I do. Once the football season ends, I look at the off season. I mean, not particularly anymore, just because dynasty content has become so relevant, 
but I, I try to take a few months where like, I'm really stepping back from content itself, not doing, you know, six to seven hours of research daily for the content and just think about business and think about how I want to be creative to the next year. Think about how we want to pivot our content. Think about the scheduling of the content. Think about the different design work we want to do. Think about different products that we could launch that we think would be super valuable. So it's like that to me, that's the funnest part of the year. Well, like if you already know May is going to be that month for you, like you're probably already really looking forward to it. Yeah, because basically once I drop the mock draft episode, I am piecing the fuck out for like a month <laughs> like i'm gonna sick. release like one episode probably just based on whoever kyle shanahan takes and just do an episode <laughs> yeah. on his okay. fit with whatever quarterback is gonna go there and like that'll be my one episode for the month of may and then the rest of the month will be spent designing merch because i have a whole bunch of other teams to get through for mm-hmm. merch design like business development for myself like working on the website making plans for the podcast upping my live stream you know doing construction back here to like get a better background and stuff like that. Like it's, I'm going to be go, go, go in the month of May, but on stuff that isn't film rooms, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, that sets up the foundation that'll, that'll set you up really good for a really long time to be able to focus on the content. Yeah. (sighs) Okay. The last thing I want to ask you about is something that we did talk about in, in the DMS. You said you have like a, a manager or like a talent agent that kind of books these, shows for you and as someone of my size like i'm not anywhere close enough to that where i can't handle you know different sponsorships and partnerships and deals coming in basically but that's first of all how did you get like linked up with whoever it is that you work with so i got introduced to my manager over at table rock management his name is spencer and dane through my buddy chris harris who's also in the fantasy space he runs the harris football podcast and and he lives here out in la and we got dinner and he's like hey have you thought about like getting somebody to handle you know doing the business side of things for you in terms of like negotiating brand deals and stuff like that and getting you a like what you're worth and b like actually being able to more fill out your schedule and stuff because he's already got a rolodex of brands that he can call on like you don't have to do it yourself like i was spending a lot of time right you know trying to source i guess you could say brand deals because again like that's like my main revenue source for paying my mortgage and stuff like that. And um, he's like, have you thought about, you know, getting somebody that can do that for you and take that off your plate? And like, they'll get 20% of it. But having somebody get 20%, but also keep me fully booked, still makes me more money than not being fully booked, but keeping 100% of the bookings. Like in the end, like it's way more profitable for me to have somebody else handle that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they take their cut, but at least I'm fully booked because then I'm consistently you know, making money and ensuring that I'm not like going to go broke basically. Is it an easy process? Are they just kind of, they, you know, they say, Hey, there's five, 10 brands here. Let me know which of these you would like to work with. And they just try to like link it up or, or do they just like tell you like, Hey, you're promoting fucking X, Y, Z today. We're going to send you a sample of it. And you just kind of got to throw it up, uh, up there on screen. Oh no. They, they asked me like, if I want to work with certain, like they'll be like, Hey, do your research on this brand. Tell me if you want to work with them or not at so-and-so rate let me know like they'll basically prospect and but they'll ask me if i want to do it so i only work with companies i actually want to work with like they never sign me up for stuff without telling me like they never they also know like there's certain brands that i just don't want to do like i'm never going to work with them again so i don't even really give a shit about saying this but like raid shadow legends the only reason i worked with raid last april is because every single brand dropped me in the month of april because everybody was panicking about corona nobody knew what was going on so i lost every single sponsor that month so i was like panicking because like that's a lot of money i'm losing i gotta pay for a house i gotta pay for my life like what am i gonna do and raid was the only company that was still sponsoring people at that point so i picked up a raid sponsorship just to get me through the month but like i didn't want to do it but because of like literally a once in a century pandemic i felt like i had to because every other company pulled out like hellofresh didn't sponsor anybody for like five months like because nobody knew what was going to happen and it was it was hard last summer like can i get brands to feel comfortable spending money again because nobody knew it was going to go on and uh so i i took the raid deal because i was like i gotta put food on the table for this month but then things kind of stabilized and got back to normal so like i'm never going to work with raid again but that was the only one and only time i worked with a brand that i actually didn't want to work with because of circumstances that were so wild and out of my control that 
will never happen again. Obviously, well, hopefully never will happen again. But every other brand I've ever worked with was one that I've actually wanted to work with. I enjoyed the product. I love working with them. Like HelloFresh, I love. Hawthorne, I love. Manscaped, I love. Like all these brands that I work with, it's because I choose to. With the one exception being Raid during a start of a global pandemic. <laughs> oh, all my homies hate Raid. Apparently, that's that's the way this is going right now. Nobody likes working with Raid, by the way. Like, if you ever <laughs> see a YouTuber get sponsored by, they didn't want to do that. They had to. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Do you, when when you're working with these brands, I guess like, how 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 big would you say you would need to be to have an, an agent like this or a manager, a booking manager? you know, take that side of the work for you. Like going back, if you can go back to when you first, first started, like at what point would you look into this being a serious part of what you're doing? I think I got with them when I hit like a hundred K somewhere around there. But keep in mind, like it was a little bit different for me because my views to subscriber ratio has always been abnormally high. Mm-hmm. So most YouTube channels, you know, they'll look at my views and they'll be like, why am I not getting that? Like my, my channel, I don't know. I honestly have no idea why I've never known why, but most YouTube channels can count on about 14% of their subscriber base be watching every single show. Like you can typically, like if you have a hundred thousand subscribers, you can expect like 14,000 to be like your baseline for watching. When I was at a hundred thousand, I was getting a hundred thousand per so like I was getting 100%, not 14%. So I was getting basically the same baseline views of a channel that was over a million subscribers. I see. Which is why I got the manager at 100K because I was pulling in views that were like actually worth something to brands. So not every YouTube channel is going to make sense for that. I would say it's more dependent on views than amount of subscribers. Like if you're pulling in views, that's way above 14% per ep. Like if you are one of those channels that's pulling in the same views of somebody that's like half a million subscribers, yeah, go get a manager because you're pulling in an audience that is valuable enough to brands. But if you're pulling in like 10 to 14,000 per, I would maybe wait a little bit, grow a little bit, focus on improving the content and, you know, having that natural growth process and then get one later, I would say. So it, again, I think it's more about views and audience retention than than just raw channel size. Yeah, I hear you. I, I, I wasn't honestly, I wasn't even really asking for myself, but I, I get so many questions about like how to reach out to sponsors, like when you should start, you know, trying to get in with like bigger sponsors that you kind of hear around the industry. I th- it's always interesting hearing how people link up with different partnerships because sometimes, you know, sometimes it's so random. Like sometimes it's just like a Twitter. I, I've had partnerships. Some of my best partnerships are from like Twitter interactions that lead to partnerships within the mm-hmm. brand and some of their booking agents. I don't think there's any right or wrong way. I think reaching out via email works as well straight to the company if you want to. It's obviously a little bit more time intensive, but when you don't have the leverage like Brett has, you got to get creative with how you get in touch with people and, and kind of get on to their radar. Have you ever been approached by someone in real football to do any sort of consulting? Because you obviously have a football background, come from the NFL network. So people within the industry probably know who you are, especially now with the bigger YouTube following. And I think I think we're in a world where the content you put out kind of dictates and manifests the direction of your life in a sense, right? And I think you'll eventually, if you haven't already, got get onto the radar of like serious people. And I think we'll see more. I don't want to say like content creators or YouTube, but like people who are TV personalities are getting jobs in the NFL now. So I'm, I'm, I'm just like curious, have you ever like been in touch with people that actually work uh, a high level of football? Oh yeah. Like I, you know, I have friends that are in front offices and coaching staffs and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, it's been really fun to like build that network and like talk ball with people that uh, no have forgotten more about football than I'll ever know. Like, to be honest, like these people are people don't understand, like how how smart everybody in the league is like it's it's so funny you say that insane. because like I I but people that are in the league, if they were ever like stumble upon my channel, they'd be like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Because the same way what you just said about them is like the way I feel about you. I, I didn't really ever play football. I never like studied football. I don't understand like schemes and all this kind of shit. Like when you use actual terminology. I'm done, right? Like, give me numbers, statistics, analytics, and I could work with that. But like, I don't understand what's going on in real football. So for you to say that about them is just like, it's like mind blowing in a sense. But the numbers and statistics and analytics, 
is the blind spot for a lot of traditional football people, which is why you're seeing more people hired in in analytics. Like I know some people in analytics for a few different teams and like they're brilliant Mm -hmm. because they see the game a different way. And the best teams are the ones that combine both ways of seeing the game. And that's kind of like my objective for the channel is like, I, I've never really been strong in analytics, but I've been trying to get better over the past couple of years. And like, I know people in analytics and stuff like that. Cause I, I want to be able to kind of bridge the gap of like, here's what the numbers say. And then here's the film to give those numbers context to explain why those numbers happen. Because I think they're both key elements of building a team and building a successful organization. Uh, as for like, have I ever been approached? Like, yeah, I've been approached, but I don't want to be on the road as much as a, a scout is on the road. I don't want to leave my family. Like YouTube money is like super volatile, but it's overall, it's good. And I, I just, I'm comfortable with my life. And I feel like the amount of time on the road and the amount of time away from my family that is required to work high level with an actual team or even mid level with an actual team, I, I would selfishly turn down that because I, uh, I'm not built for, <laughs> I'm not built for being an actual scout that's been in six months at, various college campuses throughout the year um, yeah th- that would be hard for me that back injury done fucked you up forever you're, you're destined to sit in that YouTube, <laughs> chair, YouTube chair for the rest of your life no nah, dude like listen we, we we we've got it pretty good we we are um in a sense our own bosses we get to be creative when we want to be creative we get to put out the content that we want to put out but again don't don't let it mistake you brett said he puts out the one video a week but he works 50 60 hours on that which is more than most people work for a full-time job so some of the videos he puts out are, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20, 25 minutes. And the amount of time that goes into something like that, like it, it's not a mistake that that Brett is where he is. So my hat's off to you, man. You are one of my favorite creators in the space, both fantasy football and football overall. Um, you're someone that I very much admire the work and getting to really sit down with you for the first time was uh, fantastic. I'm looking forward to getting down to Atlanta for a game. The stadium's going to be fucking awesome. They got the Chick-fil-A in there, which I'm already fired up about. And, uh, and that's going to that's gonna wrap it up for the episode today. So, Brett, I can't thank you enough for coming on. If you guys are not already subscribed to his channel, Film Room, I will link that down below. Make sure you're following him on Twitter, at Brett Coleman. Just, if you don't know how to spell it, just assume that whatever letter you just put in, throw another letter on top of it, the same one. And, uh, <laughs> and that's it for today. So, Brett, again, thank you, and we are signing off. Thank you.